Bruce Dumont back. Thanks very much for joining us this evening. We've got some callers on the line, so we're going to go to them before we bring our uh, other guests who are going to join us via Zoom. Let's go to John in McHenry, Illinois. He's been waiting for quite some time. John, go ahead. You're on Beyond the Beltway. Thank you, and good evening to your guests. Thank you. Um, just something I want to bring out, three things that I haven't heard discussed, which kind of trouble me from the first hour. Okay. Um, one, the discussion about teachers' unions and their influence and in many ways negative and some positive. And number two, the poor participation of voters in local school board elections. Um, since your guests are from New Trier um, in Illinois, uh, their last school board election had less than 20 percent voter turnout. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people fill these school board meetings, but a lot of them don't come out to vote when it really matters the most. Okay. And let's let uh, wait, wait one second before you go to your next point. Let's let them discuss that matter uh, very quickly. Uh, Jennifer, okay. I'm going to start with you because you're in a public system. So yep. go ahead and then we'll hear from uh, uh, Stephanie. Well, I assume and based on my experience, the people who show up at school board meetings are the ones who vote in school board elections. Definitely. And I would encourage all of us 18 years and older to vote in every election. That's our voice. And working through the school board and showing in that definitive public way to show what policies and what um, curriculum you advocate uh, is absolutely an appropriate way to vote for your school board election. Right. And in the Catholic system? Well, are in the they, Catholic are they system, you know, well, we don't have unions, we don't have teachers' unions, and we don't have an elected school board. We don't even have one elected within yeah. the, the, the parent, parental community. Your only yeah. way of communicating your frustration or your concerns is to work with the administration or teachers directly. What but our the... next guest, I know one of our next guests, I live in a town that has very heated school board elections. And not everybody, there were open seats that nobody ran for. So it's very interesting in this climate that um, given the opportunity, a lot of people still aren't, aren't entering into I wanna, the process. I want to I bring this into the context of where we are with political discussion in the country. Right. Because I mentioned at the beginning of the program, uh, this subject is getting a lot of coverage. It's getting yeah. a lot of coverage on cable television. I think it's being fueled in a large part on the conservative side by Fox News. And my question mm -hmm. is this, is there, how widespread is this issue really? I mean, if, if the people who are exercised and have run for the school board, and this person is saying school board elections mm -hmm. aren't very high, and I've heard that for 50 years, mm -hmm. right. they're not high. So not a lot of people are participating. The people that are participating, if you're participating and, right. and you got a big mouth, you're going to get some exposure. And if you get too much exposure, uh, the National School Board Association is going to come down to the <laughs> Attorney General and say, look right. into this. And then somebody ends up describing them as domestic terrorists. Right. Why would somebody want to run for the school board? And I'm just wondering how much of this issue, the issue of, of critical race thinking and education in the classrooms and the battle between the administrators and the public, in your opinion, is real and not something that is being manufactured to gen up votes for Republicans or conservatives by Fox News. Well, Stephanie. I, I'm going to tell you it's 100 percent real. And I, uh, I, uh, my involvement in this issue in, in the Catholic sphere, so not even in the public arena, began long before I ever heard anyone on Fox News or anybody else talking about it. Let me ask the you this problem question. Is, How come we're not getting any calls on this subject tonight, or, or, or very few? Maybe uh, they're doing their kids, helping their kids with their homework. I don't know. <laughs> but, but, you know, they, I, but I will tell you it is a real issue. And it's real because, because of COVID, we saw school parents saw school in a completely different way than they'd ever that. seen it before and they started to hear what was on what was in the lessons plan and what was in the zoom clubs things that come up that aren't necessarily on a syllabus and kids weren't always coming home and complaining about what their teachers were doing and so parents were starting to hear it are they more concerned about that or are they more concerned about covid and wearing masks if kids have to wear masks and, and be I'd say it's vaccinated 50 50 and the reason why is that um, I would say it's 50-50. There's a lot of parents that once they see what's going on in the classroom are not happy with the ideology and the indoctrination. Jennifer, How, I want to ask yeah. Jennifer. Jennifer, do you see it that same way? Would you 
analyze the political climate the same way that Stephanie has just described it? No, I guess I would look at it from another lens. I would look at this in the past few years with this racial reckoning in our country, that there's an, a more awareness to look at our history in a more complete and act not just accurate, because I believe it's been accurate, but cherry-picked and whitewashed. And I think there's a movement, and it begins with education, it begins early with toddlers, to, to learn our history that's complete and fair and nuanced and represents all voices, rather than teach a single whitewashed narrative. And while the, it's a powerful instinct to, um, to, to run away from acknowledging our shortcomings, I think about the faith tradition I was raised in, and we didn't go to church once a week and receive the redemption, receive re reconciliation, receive all the good, comfortable stuff. First, you have to acknowledge your shortcomings. You have to confess and embrace that to move forward both as individuals and as a country. John also mentioned, John also mentioned uh, teachers' unions. They, they, they're, they're behind the eight ball at the moment. Would you acknowledge that, that nationally in this political debate, that teachers and teachers' union, primarily in large mm -hmm. municipalities, mm -hmm. they are perhaps losing the support of parents because of some of their positions on COVID, COVID testing, and masks in the classroom. Jennifer. I can't speak to the unions. To be honest, I haven't followed their... I can't, I can't speak to that. I would follow science and CDC guidelines and being careful about any kind of, you know, spreading any germs. I'm not opposed to masks. Yeah, what, Stephanie? I would say on the union front, uh, what we saw in Chicago in particular, it, you know, you don't have to be um, in a, a Chicago residence to see that th there were definitely places where the unions held parents hostage, basically based on, on wanting to push uh, demands beyond the safety and security and health of students and faculty. Mm -hmm. And what we saw last year in Chicago, for example, were all sorts of other kinds of demands before they came back into the classroom that had nothing to do with masks or plexiglass or um, social distancing. And so there was definitely, um, in many places, um, a feeling that unions were putting themselves before students mm -hmm. uh, and, pa and parent concerns and, and teachers even. Jennifer Warren uh, Warner, by the way, joins us now. She is uh, with Stand for Children. Jennifer, thank you very much for joining us. You're one of our other special guests this evening. Take a moment to explain uh, to the audience what is Stand for Children? What do they do? Yes, well, good evening, um, and thanks so much for having me. Um, so Stand for Children, uh, we like to think of ourselves as catalysts for educational change. Um, we work with parents and community members uh, across the country um, to be involved in their local schools um, so that they can uh, have a voice and seat at the table. Um, we work for um, you know uh, funding uh, resources for schools to ensure that schools are receiving uh, adequate funding to support and, and grow the minds of our wonderful kids across the country. Um, we work for high school success. Uh, there are proven research backed uh, programs that support kids to ensure that they can graduate from high school um, ready for college, ready for career, ready to be being citizens. Jennifer, um, we, we, we've got a um, we've got a we've got a break right now. But we've got a break right now for a commercial break. When we come back, I want you to elaborate a little bit more. I know you listened to hour number one. You want to weigh in on some of those topics. We'll also be hearing from uh, uh, Andana uh, Mubuyi, and uh, she'll be joining us as well. I'm Bruce Dumont. Thanks for joining us tonight on Beyond the Beltway. Bruce Dumont, we continue with our Zoom guests, uh, Jennifer Warner, and also joining us now is Andana Mubuyahi, and uh, she joins us uh, from her home in Evanston, Illinois. Uh, ladies, thanks very much for joining us. I want to go to Jennifer first because you uh, you were listening to the first hour. Uh, is there anything that uh, you heard that you think needs uh, dramatic interpretation or reinterpretation? <laughs> I mean, I, I would say that I was really glad to hear um, that both guests, uh, you know, want to see accurate and thorough history in our schools. I think that's mm -hmm. something that we all um, want to see. Something I think just was an interesting theme coming up from um, from the discussion, and I think, um, you know, just some some questions about why our history. You know, we need to have leaders who are either good or bad. 
right? These are complex people. Um, and we have to start being comfortable with that in our history and in the formation of our country. Um, we started with a lot of wonderful ideals that weren't fully um, realized. And we need to know that. And we certainly need that next generation of students to know that so that we're continuing to build that more perfect union. I think we all can agree to that. But if we start with this idea that everything was perfect and maybe there were a few glimpses, is a little bit of the kind of wrong balance, I think. Um, and, and I think it comes from this place of wanting um, to have this great story when really the facts and the complexity is what we need and I think is the patriotic thing for us to do um, to bring forward the ideals of our country. And Donna, I want to go to you because uh, you went to Evanston Township High School. Then uh, you moved away for many, many years. And then you decided you wanted to come back to Evanston because you wanted your children to have the good quality education that you received. But when you came back, you did not find such such a great location or environment there. Uh, have I summarized that correctly? And what was it about the current environment there that bothers you? Uh, well, you did pretty much sum it up as it was. Um, I, I grew up in Evanston. I'm the fifth generation of a large family here. And I went off to college in New York City right after graduating HHS, Evanston Township mm -hmm. High School. And I lived away for over 20 years. And I got married, had my children. And when we decided after living in Canada for quite some time, we decided to return to the States. I finally decided, well, why don't we move to Evanston where I grew up? It's a lot less expensive than living in New York City, um, where it's, where I really wanted to go. But in Evanston, you can have a quality of life, less expensive, very good schools, diverse environment. You know, it wasn't perfect, but based on the education that my children had received in Oakville, Ontario, I felt that the education in Evanston would be um, on par. What did you find? What they, with what they were learning in, in uh, Canada. What did you and, find? I, I'm sorry, go ahead. What did you find when you got to Evanston? Oh, there was oh so much going on. Um, the Evanston that I grew up in and left back in 1994, I came back in 2018 to an extremely polarized town um, where there were people labeling Evanston as being the bedrock of our nation's white supremacy being a place where black people could never get ahead, being a place where um, there really were very little opportunities for African-Americans or even minorities um, overall. Whereas my experience and the experience of many families like my own here in Evanston was not like that. I can say that yes, there were, um, there were some injustices based on the history of Evanston, um, that had to do with redlining, that had to do with um, discrimination that took place over the years, especially since my family's been here since the late 1800s. So of course they did experience um, a number of things over the years. And Dola, let me, oh. let, 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 let me interrupt this. Let me interrupt and ask you, what was it about the teaching that your children were receiving in Evanston? What was it that got you upset that caused you or that forced you or moved you to run for the school board? What what really ticked you off about how your children were being taught? What really ticked me off was when we first returned, my daughter was in eighth grade and my son, my son was a sophomore. <clears throat> and um, my, my son would come home and say things to me such as, um, you know, I want to be a civil rights lawyer okay, you know, nothing wrong with that. But then he would start to tell me about all of the injustices that have taken place, you know, against Black people and how one particular party has always been on the side of Black Americans. And I said, that's not true. And I'm like, you know, depending on what time period they were, you know, we were with one party and then we switched to another party. Whoever was doing for us what we felt was best for us as a community, that's where we were historically so what for his what party teacher, what what party was was he told were, were the good guys he was 
he was told by his teacher that the Democratic Party has always been on the side of African Americans. Not true. And I told him that historically <laughs> that is not true. And I, t I gave him the history of both parties. I gave him a more thorough history of African American history, including all of the contributions that our people have made since inception of this nation and even prior, mm -hmm. which of course he didn't learn while we were in Canada, but I felt mm -hmm. I was like in, you know, um, super, super <laughs> hyper mode having to teach my children what they had not learned while we were in Canada. Okay. And I, my main problem with the teacher was that I felt if you're going to teach history, and this was an advanced placement history course, that you should teach the entire history. Don't just teach what you feel works best for you. Whether it's good or bad, whether I'm, you like it or not, I'm, teach I'm, it. I want to I want to interrupt and I, and I, and I want to bring Jennifer back into the conversation. Jennifer, uh, with with your group, are are you involved in the type of discussions that take place between teachers and parents who believe that they have a responsibility and they have a right to tell their teachers how they want their students to be taught? Is is that a right that you think a parent has? Or do you think that is a responsibility that a professionally trained educator should have? Yeah, so our organizing model really is about making sure that parents know uh, what avenues and levers are available to them, whether it's going to school board meetings, voting, obviously, it being a big one, um, and public comment periods, which are really important and utilized often uh, for state boards as they're determining curriculum. Um, and we often uh, have, you know, toolkits on meeting with your teacher and having effective conversations with your teacher. Um, I think that, you know, education is a huge, <laughs> a huge undertaking. Taking. Sure. Um, that's why almost, you know, more than 50% of teachers have a master's degree. Um, but it's obviously something that is a community decision, right? It's a community involvement. Um, parents need to know what's going on and have avenues for doing so. But we also need to trust our teachers to teach us. The majority of uh, Americans in public polls have said that they do. Um, our teachers undergo uh, extensive training um, for having difficult conversations, uh, for example, to ensure that the curriculum that they're teaching is appropriate for their students in that age bracket. Um, but yeah, but neither the, but, one should but be done the, in a vacuum, which Jennifer, is why you have so many um, parents showing up at school board meetings. And Jennifer, let me let me let me let me ask teacher conferences. Let, let me let me ask this. <clears throat> Based on the, the story that we just heard uh, from uh, Andola, do you believe that in the case, the case that she referenced, when she felt mm -hmm. that her student, that there was a teacher who said that, you know, one party was better for black people than the other, is that something that just one person should complain about? I mean, should you go to the principal? I mean, uh, when you have something that is, that is so demonstratively incorrect, and I'm not I'm not painting a rosy picture of the Republican Party. I'm just saying you can't say that one party right. has been, you know, for 300 years has been good for for African Americans. Uh, what should a parent like that do? Should they run for office? What do they do? Yeah, well, I think uh, that what every parent would do, right? They, I'm assuming, you also sat down and talked with the teacher to, you know, yeah. understand what was the context. Right. Um, um, of course, having first talked with your uh, with your own child to understand, you know, maybe they misunderstood or you always give, I think, grace to people and then to conversations that you haven't had. But certainly it's something that you'd want to address. And in many cases, um, and it's great to, to see that this is happening, it can spur parents to be involved, right? School board members um, are public servants in all literal senses of the word as they are often not paid um, for doing that work. Um, and so, you know, it's another place where parents, many of whom uh, are school board members, our parents to be involved in the education system. Do you see uh, the, the political movements in the country, be they left or right, do you see them, uh, in your view, aggressively pursuing education and the education community as a way to uh, fan their particular philosophy of politics and indoctrinate children to their thinking? I'm going to start with you on this one, Jennifer. Is this a national movement, maybe on both sides of the political aisle? Um, 
Look, I work for an education advocacy organization. We're always happy to have more people talking about education. It's the number one um, issue in our minds. And then, you know, you do public polling and it's always in the top three, but it has not been the issue that has gotten people uh, to the polls. Uh, other issues tend to be uh, those issues that drive people to the polls. Over the last decades, the funding for schools um, across the board has continued to drop. Teacher shortages are a real issue. This pandemic uh, and what teachers are experiencing right now is not making that any easier. Um, the diversity in teachers uh, is a struggle across the country. There are a lot of really important issues um, for which we need everyone to be involved and want to see everyone being involved. But we need to always have a civil conversation about it to be able to bring our ideas, our thoughts, our disagreements and do so in a civil way. That's what democracy is about. And if there are parties and, that are pushing that, I'm all for it. And Dola, when, we come, when we come back, I want to get Andola I want to get Andola's response never, when we come back. I want, to, okay. I want to hear from Andola Sorry. when we come back. I'm Bruce Dumont. Don't go away. Bruce Dumont back. Hour number two continues. And uh, before the break, we have, uh, by the way, 1-800-723-8289. We have a lot of callers on the line. We're going to bring them into the conversation. But before the break, I asked a question, and I said that, uh, and Donna, I'm going to give you a chance to respond to it, and let me just set it up again. Uh, are we at a point in our history where uh, right-of-center groups and left-of-center groups have found that school boards and being involved in school issues is a uh, is a is a training ground uh, to get teachers and to get students indoctrinated into their philosophy of politics. What do you think of that, and Donna? If I speak specifically about Evanston, yes, I do believe so. And the reason why I say that is because the another reason why I decided to run was because of the academic achievement gap of African American students in my town. Uh -huh where nearly 60% cannot read at grade level. And rather than addressing what the root cause might be, the response has been from not only the school board, but also some activists in the community that it all had to do with white supremacy. Now, I know many of the families here in Evanston I know the history of many of the families here in Evanston, and I'm aware that certain there are certain families that have issues that affect their children's daily lives, their education. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that racism does not exist because it most definitely does. But if I speak about me personally, at a time where my parents were having difficulties when I was growing up, I wasn't able to concentrate on my schoolwork. I wouldn't turn in assignments. I wouldn't do, I would sometimes act out in school. And because of what was taking place at home, it affected my schoolwork. So what I would do is I would reach out to the school. I even, you know, spoke at the, um, in my interviews, even spoke, reached out to the principal of a couple of the schools. And I mentioned that I could assist with helping out with some of these children because I have an educational nonprofit as well. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it was as if everyone wanted to ignore the numerous other issues that do affect our children daily as to why some of our children mm -hmm. are not doing well. Right. And the so main they, and they focus don't, so they was don't on go to... the race of the yeah. teachers, right. on addressing um everything except for family dynamics. Do you, a uh, question to you, and then we're going to move on and take some telephone calls. Once upon a time, uh, the, the national news media, specifically when newspapers were far more dominant than they are today, uh, Evanston, Illinois was held up as uh, the, 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 the be-all to end-all in public education. It was the place where integration worked, where the, where the, uh, the, the, the communication between blacks and whites worked, students got along, all that was, that, that was part of the, uh, I would say, the, the, the public image, the narrative of what Evanston, Illinois 
represented. Now, I don't know whether you went there during that period per, per se, but when you came back, you, you came back and found something different. And I'm wondering if the great challenge of those involved in education in Evanston today is you were trying to live up to an ideal, a, 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 a mantle that was given to you 40 or 50 years ago. And the reality is when you look with a microscope at Evanston's school, high school, it ain't that great. It certainly isn't what it was 30 or 40 years ago. And yet you have a national news media is when they check their Nexus and Lexus, they find that this is one of the great high schools in America. Do, do, is there some truth to what I just said, Nandola? Nandana. It, it was absolutely one of the best school districts that you could go mm -hmm. to. I'm tell, When I left ETHS, because I went to elementary, middle, and high school here, mm -hmm. and when I left ETHS in 1994, I had one of the best educations you could imagine. I arrived in New York City, and when I tell you that I was far ahead of many people that I encountered in New York City that had gone to New York City public schools mm -hmm. and even in Westchester County, mm -hmm. as well as Long Island and New Jersey. And I was proud of the education that I received in Evanston. Mm -hmm. okay. And for me to then return with my children over 20 years later, and, and I will say that my both of my children are getting a very good education, but that's also because I challenge my children. My son is now at New York University in his mm -hmm. freshman year, mm -hmm. um, and my daughter is now a junior. I challenge my children. I do follow them on all of their assignments. When they're not doing what they're mm -hmm. supposed to do, I speak with them. I also reach out to their right. teachers. I'm a very active parent. And Donna, right, so right now, what, those, what, I, what, I've got, what I've got to do right now, and this is for everybody, uh, our conversation has really engaged people around the country. They want to participate, so I'm going to go to some calls right now. Let's go to David on line one. He's listening to us on KLBJ in Austin, Texas. Go ahead, David. Okay, I want to talk about them talking about true history. Well, often in debates like this, the truth is the first casualty, and I will talk about, they were talking about Robert E. Lee. Now, number one point, Robert E. Lee released his father-in-law's slave because his father-in-law, in his will, had released his slave, and Robert E. Lee was the executioner of, this, of the uh, will. Executor. He had Executor. Two couple, Executor. Yeah, okay. <laughs> exactly, right. He had a couple of body servants, and if she, the woman doesn't believe me, she can consult Doug, Douglas Freeman's four-volume biography of Robert E. Lee. And it'll talk about that. No, but that, that, that was, if you're the executor of a will, you have to do as the person recommended. Exactly. But, it was, but that's, it not was, what, it that's not what Jennifer was talking about. She was talking about Robert E. Lee specifically, what he did, not what his father did or grandfather did. So, I mean, well, we're she talking was, two different stories she, here. No, she was implying that Robert E. Lee was against slavery, which he was not. He released the slaves because the will told him to. He owned a couple of body servants. It's in the okay. uh, Douglas Freeman biography. Now, point number two, the tale about whipping and crying and sawing Whining, and all that yeah. was a phony atrocity story made up by a newspaper during the Civil War to attack the Confederacy. It has absolutely no truth. Jennifer Lind wants to respond because she was shaking her head negatively as you spoke. We're going to give her the last word, then we're going to move on. Jennifer, do you want to clarify your point? Sure. Freeman's um, four-volume biography is sheer hagiography, largely hagiography, that does not address the correct or accurate or complete history of Robert E. Lee. There are several other authors, starting with Alan Nolan, you could look at to read the truth about Robert E. Lee. And it does, should not diminish his accomplishments if we see the full and accurate history of him. Um, like our other, like the founding fathers, he was not a founding, but we should really understand and study to and reckon with their full nuanced history, their tragedies and their triumphs all intertwined okay. together. We all agree on that point. David, thank you very much for your call. Let's move elsewhere in Texas. Let's go to Ben, listening to us uh, on El Paso, Texas. Go ahead, line two. Yeah, um, besides uh, CRT, one of the biggest areas of contention of all board of all the board meetings from around uh, throughout the United States was the, the area of wearing masks. 
And um, when when Michael Olsterholm, uh, one of uh, two uh, Biden's top uh, medical advisors, said that unless you're wearing an N95 or a KN95 mask, you're not wearing anything at all. Yeah, cloth masks don't have any use whatsoever mm-hmm. against COVID. And why we uh, have to mask our kids up where they can't breathe, uh, that was a big reason. That was, and that also goes to the political mm-hmm. um, uh, statement that the, the school, board, school boards were trying to make. Right. right. Well, let, let's talk. By the way, I, I think that that is even hotter issue in students right, the, over over the CRT. So yeah. I want to get each. Re- I want to get your reaction first, well, and then. Uh, well, I think Jennifer. part of it, yeah, is that um, you know a lot of parents feel like um, you know the school. First of all, children. You know, if if we're going to follow the science, it's been shown that children are not massive spreaders. Of COVID, and that they they don't they certainly don't bear the the same risks when they do get COVID, right. and so on. I think there was also this um, there's a strong feeling uh, from parents is that it 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 becomes a charade that these aren't necessarily effective, that all of a sudden it it really becomes an issue um, of control of students. Is it more about is it more but is it more about the teachers, Jennifer? I would think it's also protecting Not Jennifer. teachers. Yeah, Jennifer. Right. Yeah, two Jennifers tonight. Two Jennifers. It's a good name. I it's think it's the unions, unions pu- yeah. presented it that way. Yes. Certainly masks can protect the teachers and everyone in the building. They're certainly not perfect. I come from a long line of teachers in my family and um, elementary school teachers as well. And, you know, the kids start with Mickey Mouse mask and they end up with, you know, a, a princess mask because they're switching them around, they're falling off. Mm-hmm. They're certainly not perfect. But especially for the teachers, I think it's something to support them on if they feel more protected. Okay. Let's go to Spokane, Washington. Joy is listening to us on KXLY. Go ahead, Joy. You know, I think one of the things that um, is a more general um, difference between the right and the left, or at least it's how I see it, and I'm on the left, is um, how we are looking at the issues or what's being discussed or what's being taught. And I hear on the right the word indoctrination much more um, then on the left, I personally, I think of it as more of awareness, as providing information. Um, just for example, you look at uh, um, a... Hold off for a second. It? Hold off for a, sep- a second with your example. We do have to go to a commercial break. When we come back, we'll continue okay. with you. You can give us the example and we'll let everyone respond. 1-800-723-8289. Don't go away. I'm Bruce Dumont. This is Beyond the Beltway. A public service announcement brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. Bruce Dumont, but we are back for our last segment this evening, and uh, Joy from Spokane, Washington, was on. And uh, uh, Joy, bring us up to date specifically. What is your question? Well, well, so I was looking at indoctrination versus awareness and inform. I mean, you look from Mr. Rogers introducing a black um, um, character on his show, uh-huh. and the controversy that started on um, on the LGBT. TQ um, population, you know, if 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 um, Sesame Street has a gay character, from the right you hear it's indoctrination. Um, you are looking at transgender boys and girls. Well, if that's discussed, it's indoctrination that we want to turn every one of the the boys and girls at school into a transgender um, boy or girl. When in fact, all of these different groups have faced more violence and more um, hate and more bias. And so from my standpoint, introducing these concepts, introducing our history, introducing differences is increasing awareness, is increasing people being comfortable with each other. There are kids in your school who have two mothers and who have two dads. So do we not talk about 
lesbians and gays, they may have a transgender big sister. So we not talk about it because everyone in school is going to turn to Joy, transgender. S- stay yeah. on the stay yeah. stay on the line. It was a it's a very good question. I think I think we all understand yeah. it now. The difference between indoctrination and awareness. Uh, you use right. the transgender uh, debate. Uh, so I want to get both. I'm going to start with you, Jennifer, on uh, your response to that, and then we'll hear from the Stephanie. Well, it sounds like our caller, Joy, what she's bringing up in awareness is lifting all voices and avoiding the danger of a single narrative or a single story. If we only teach a single narrative that can be, um, it's dangerous to not lift every person, every uh, voice from marginalized communities that have typically not been represented in our education in a balanced or nuanced way. I think that's where the awareness can come from. Let, let, I, I, I want to ask uh, uh, Jennifer Warner the same question. Jennifer, we haven't heard from you for a while. Uh, uh, your position on, on teaching of, of transgender issues, and is it something that should start in high school and grammar school? Uh, where would you put it as uh, um, a wise point to introduce the concept that people are different? Well, I think uh, raising the concept that people are different should uh, start kind of right away because that's uh, something we all recognize that Uh there are people who are different from us. I think the point is that, uh, as uh, Jennifer Lind uh, pointed out, is that there are uh, wide facets of people with diverse experiences, backgrounds, and lived lives who have contributed positively to our country, and we need to explore and share and celebrate all of them. Some of them might be transgender. Some of them might be people of color. Some of them might be lesbian or gay. That doesn't diminish their contribution to our country, just as many of the callers and uh, guests on this program have indicated that those who have held slaves in the past, we don't diminish or refuse to talk about them because of the other things that they brought to the table. We should do that across the board. Uh, Stephanie, your well, response. And I think, I think, Joy, I wanted to address is one of the things that our parents have seen is what what may have begun as a a good idea, and that is to introduce ideas of of differences of people, diversity and awareness and compassion and welcoming. All of those things, I think we all will agree, are are good qualities. What, What happens is indoctrination happens when a particular view on some of these issues is 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 provided to the students and it is dictated in a way where the stu- the students are not allowed to criticize, dissent, question, or bring in any critical components of maybe that particular lecture or that presentation. And that's what we were seeing as parents that th- that's where you cross the line of indoctrination and I think as Jennifer said we should always have another viewpoint. I agree. The problem is we we have been seeing a one particular viewpoint with the silencing of dissent and questioning or debate on those issues you, and not giving the other side. Do you, That's when it becomes indoctrination. Do you think that a that a teacher teaching in a in a, in a school system today could present a case that transgenderism or transgender is not a healthy lifestyle. Could someone in a keep a job pub, in a public school? Probably not in public school. You know, I'm in the Catholic system. Do you agree with that? So. Well, they certainly would. They be able to keep the job no, in it, a Catholic it, school. Well, no. There's very, you know, Catholic doctrine is very, very clear on the um, awareness yeah. of transgender issues and the compassion, even on homosexuality. But, but all yes. But also the viewpoint of um, accept, you know, what what is acceptable and what is um, considered um, false versus true compassion. And, do, and 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 Donna, let me ask you that question: Do you think it would be possible for a uh, a teacher today in a public school system to present a case uh, in opposition to transgenderism? Would that teacher have a job, or would they be protected? under uh, enlightenment, enlightenment and uh, general freedom of expression, in your view, and Donna? In my view, no, they would not. They would lose their job. Even if the, if the uh, school system did not dismiss them immediately, there would be so much backlash from the community that I live in yeah. that eventually that educator would be um, fired. Jennifer Lynn, do you, do you agree that 
with what Andola just said, that a teacher who, who would take a more traditional approach, I won't even say a Christian approach, but a more traditional approach on, 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 on gender issues, that they would not be able to present a case that challenges the, the concept of transgenderism or its dominance in uh, as part of the contemporary discussion. I think a teacher should not be able to push their own personal views or opinions on such an issue or tell, t tell students what's the right way to live. But it's not their personal opinion. I think what Bruce is asking, I think it's valid, is there are, um, you know, there is another side to transgenderism. I mean, and that is there, there is, um, you know, there is a scientific fact to that, you know, genetically, if you're male, you're male. There's and a different side to there's Robert a Lee. There's a biology. Know. And right. if you say that, like Dave Chappelle, you could be canceled. We have to pause. Uh, Debbie, uh, Sacramento, I'm sorry we did not get to you. But again, uh, Jennifer Warner, we thanks very much for your joining us this evening. And, uh, and Donna Mubayahi, thank you very much for joining us via Zoom this evening. Uh, Jennifer Lind, thank you very much. Stephanie Hitt, thank you very much. Welcome. She did a pretty good job on her yeah, maiden voyage. Yeah, say welcome, Jennifer. Welcome. Frankie we do, Rodriguez. We'll I'm Bruce Dumont. Good night.